You know, one of my favorite movies is a Denzel Washington movie. It's called Remember the Titans. And when he gets into the football stadium, he looks up in the football at the empty stadium and he says, this is my sanctuary. And when I go to the Ocala sales, I go into that ring, into the ring where they sell the horses, and I, I feel the exact same way. I say, this is my sanctuary because the horse sales is where I've done, even when I, even when I was a broke, up-and-coming trainer with n- nobody to buy a horse for, that's always been my forte, always been my game is buying young horses. And truly, the Ocala Breeder Sales set, uh, ring is my sanctuary. And what I do is I go to a sale. Now, I have never been able to compete with Todd Pletcher and Wesley Ward and the guys that have big money to spend on horses. I have to go to a sale, and I need to find a horse that they didn't notice but could be equally good. And I've done it many times over the years with Peace Rules, 85 and a 50, Citrus Kid, Lovely Isle. I mean, great horses that went on to grade one victories, but... I had to find them and buy them for a lot less money, and I had a hope that somebody with more money than me couldn't buy that horse, and I've been very, very successful at that. And what I do is I'll go to the Ocala sale. It's an 1,100-horse sale, and we spend five or six days before the sale watching every single horse run past. And I don't look. I make a very specific point not to look at pedigree. I look at the horse. I want to see the individual. And I want to see the way that horse hits the ground. I want to see the way his legs break out in front of him, the way his knees snap outward, and the way his foot hits the ground. And when that foot hits the ground, I want to see the power of his hind end because we all know, one thing we know about horses, the engine is never in the front, not in the good ones. It's always in the back. And I want to see I want to see that a- engine kick in, and I want to see the thrust of that horse going forward to his front legs. So I watch that horse every step of the way. They usually work a quarter of a mile or an eighth of a mile, and I'll watch that horse run that quarter or eighth of a mile, and at the same time, it should be, to me, I call it poetry in motion. The head, the shoulder, and the rear end are all going in positive motion together they're all working very very tight together to form i'll grab an owner i'll see a horse that i really like and i'll play him back the slow motion video of a horse that i'm just absolutely enamored with and i'll say now that's poetry in motion the head is bobbing up and down at the right time the front legs are coming out at the right time and the thrust of the rear end is just incredibly powerful so that horse has to pass that aspect When that horse, I would say for every 10 horses out of those 1,100 that run past me, two of them make my list as far as the way they move. So at the, I'll watch 1,100 horses go by. I'll have what we call a short list of about 220 to 240 horses that have made my cut, made my list by the way that they move past me in just that 12, 14 second glimpse I've had of that horse, I'm going to narrow it down to 220 or 240 horses. Now, what I do at the end of that under tax show is I'll take that 240 horses and I'll open. We have these catalogs. Each catalog has about 600 horses in it. And when we open it, it's got the entire family for that particular horse. Now I'll make my comments over here, like this particular horse where we, I open to this horse, hip number 875, and it says steady. That that means the horse was steady, had a steady action to it, but didn't necessarily make my cut. You know, not, it's not a positive comment for me. I will look at those horses that did make my cut and now I will eliminate a few on pedigree. And I would say probably 30 or 40 of those horses I'm gonna be able to eliminate because the mother has had 12 foals and none of them were any good, or the mother has had eight foals and the highest earner, they've all won, but the highest earner has been $20,000. That doesn't interest me. There has to be something happening in that family. So I'll take that 240 and I'll knock it down to about 200 the day after the under tax show is over. Now, generally, 
after the Under Attack show's over, we have Saturday and Sunday to look at horses. The Under Attack show is all week the previous week. Saturday and Sunday, I have to look at 200 horses. I try. I could probably, when I'm when I'm really in a good mode and I'm not being slowed down by owners or other people, I could probably easily look at 120 to 140 a day. So in that two-day period, I will get to look at all 200 to 220 horses. Generally, I will say okay to half of them. So when I get done looking at them, I will have 120 left. And then I will do a relook at that 120 and probably eliminate 10 for something that cropped up overnight or something that I didn't notice the first time. So by the time that the two days of looking at horses is over, I will have narrowed it down to about 110 horses over a four-day sale that started out with 1,100 horses. So I will have it na- narrowed down to 25 or 30 horses a day that I am willing to buy. Now, of course, I don't know what my peers are thinking about those 30 horses. So I, I have to go in and with an idea that I'm going to try and buy X amount of those 30 horses. So I go back to my buyers, and I know this before the sale starts. I may have... 10 buyers looking for 10 horses and I will give all of my buyers that list of 120 or so horses that I've narrowed it down to and I know it seems like the good thing is everybody's looking for something different and most of my owners trust my opinion that I'm going to find the right horse for them so I know that this certain owner is looking for a filly this guy's looking for a colt This guy's looking for a New York bread. I can narrow it down in groups based by owners. I never have two owners that want the same horse. When I do, I'll find a reason not to buy that horse because I don't want to irritate either one of them. And, But it's easy. I got it down to a science. I figured it out. So um, we'll we'll go into that. We'll go into the first day of the sale. Maybe I'll have 25 or 30 horses on my list scattered out throughout the day out of those 200 or so 250 that are going through the ring that day and i'm just waiting for the right one to fall through the the cracks and when i buy a horse i immediately tell the owner who i feel i bought the horse for hey we got a horse you know i got your horse i got your hip number uh 172 take a look that owner will now go on the computer watch the replay get all excited look at the pedigree i'll tell him why i like the horse i'll tell him why we bought the horse and i might buy two horses in a row or three horses in a row it's happened and um tell you a funny story uh last month i was at the may sale and i'm i got a guy that wants hip number 174 and a guy that wants hip number 175 and i bought hip number 174, and I was so excited that I forgot to bid on 175. And I'm like, damn, what? And I go back, and I'm like, what happened with 175? And they said, oh, it was a buyback for 50000 oh. <sighs> Run to the barn. I go to that the guy that bought the horse back. What do you want for that horse? He says, well, I bought it back for 50 I want 50 I said, you know what? I'll give you 45 He said, sold. I called the owner. I said, listen, your trainer is a genius. That, I, I knew that horse was going to be a buyback. I went back and got you $5,000 cheaper. So I always find a way to self-promote throughout this whole deal. Anyway, uh, so we sit through four days of sales. Hopefully, when it's all over, I get my 10 horses. But I know, I know what I feel a horse is worth. I know how much over that number I'm willing to go. But I'm a tough guy. I spend my owner's money like it's my money and i do not get involved in the battle of egos was what we call it like the green monkey who went for 16 million dollars you had the two biggest egos in the game on either side of the ring knowing that the horse was worth maybe 1 million and they went to 16 million because neither one of them wanted to give up but eventually you have to i don't play like that if I think a horse is worth 60, I will tell an owner I want a 20% cushion because I really like the horse or maybe we should go 70 on it and we get to 70 and I stop. Occasionally I go over. <laughs> Occasionally I, I go over and then I have to work my magic on that owner and say, listen, I went to 80, but believe me, this horse is worth the money. So, um, so we get the horses 
after we buy the horses, there's a you have a window of opportunity before you remove the horse from the sale where you can vet the horse out. Many, many horses, when I really feel that I'm genuinely on a horse, I may pre-vet it so I have no need to vet it afterwards. But quite often, we have to post-vet a horse and that horse is usually a horse that I didn't think I could buy, but he somehow fell into my price range and I didn't do my due diligence before the sale. And I will pr- post vet that horse and quite often we'll find that there's a problem and we return the horse. There is a return policy. So we do get to return those horses. If uh, And if it's a borderline return, they go th- before a panel and you sometimes get stuck with the horse if you don't want it, whether you like it or not. It, the panel decides if you have the ability to turn it back. But bone fractures, they're gone. Uh, breathing issues, they're gone. So the, the, the main issues that can arise with a young horse is gone. 